Well, there's a home stretch here on Arise Prime Time. If you just join us, you're welcome. And this is the point on the program. I introduce my guest analyst who's here to give her perspective on the issues so far. I'm joined here in the studio by Arise News analyst, Dr. Constance Ikoku. Good to see you and thanks for your time. Well, listening to the World Bank uh, Country Director and uh, Dr. Nachi, uh, you know, it, it paints a very gloomy and, you know, worried, Not worrying Dr. picture. Not the World Bank director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. looking at uh, the, the World Bank yes. uh, director. And, uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Nachi, when he said, uh, he also said that uh, he spoke about institutions. So uh, we, we closed on national planning. But again, let's start talking about solutions, uh, some of the key concerns. Uh, he spoke about national planning and he said, well, uh, if someone as Dr. Nachi would say, I don't know if national planning is still there. Back in the day, I, I actually worked as a consultant to national planning. What does that mean to us as Nigerians and even Africans, uh, speaking of developmental institutions? Um, there are different ways that this conversation could go. Um, it's, it's a complex issue. The economy, politics, and then the impact on Nigerians or Africans in general. Um, the starting point is that for me today, when you look at the past couple of years, there seems to have been a systematic <coughs> impoverishment of the people. You don't even need a report, World Bank or whatever institution to know that. We're living the reality of it. Today, for instance, you go to the market, a pack of, um, a pack of what used to be uh, plantain chips maybe yeah. 250 now it's 500 petrol uh, from 300 to over 500 uh, helium taxes if you used to pay one five now it's about four thousand five hundred five five thousand depending on the on the time of the day so it's there for us to see we do know that people will fall into poverty then the question is what is the government doing about it and what's our relation with this so-called development institutions on the one hand um, a lot of people will say, yes, take what you can from development institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, whatever they, off they have to offer, and the ones that are useful to you. On the other hand, some would say, hey, be careful, because more than 40 years of development relationship with these institutions hasn't really benefited Africa. We haven't um, developed in the way that we wish or wished, depending on what the definition of development is. So I take us to something like a very interesting good book, everyone should read it, uh, Dan Bissam Moyo's Dead Aid. Um, she published it a couple of, uh, many years ago actually, she's an economist from Zambia. And the argument, you know, was that she tried to explore the malignant nature of aid from developing countries to, from developing organizations to developing countries. And the view that those types of aids will help you develop. She challenged it. And so you can also extend it to loan, development loans. Is the, is the government looking at your unique context as a country, the local conditions, the specific needs? Mm -hmm. What is your philosophy about the type of country you want to build? What, is, what are your ideas? It has to be yours. If it's not yours, anybody and everybody can tell you anything and then you're moving back and forth without much uh, positive impact in the long term. And it brings us uh, to uh, African leaders. Uh, now, we're looking at Nigeria, we're also looking at the continent, and uh, every now and then, just recently, African leaders, we are all in Paris. And uh, the development institutions that are already in place in these African countries haven't actually worked. So it, it brings us to the argument of trust versus data which the continent is still struggling with. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, we keep asking, how do you recognize those who need it? And Dr. Nachi also said, uh, well, the fear here is how the political class may hijack to the extent that those who truly need the palliative may not get it. So the issue of palliative, I think it's, the problem is bigger than palliatives we should be looking at a comprehensive approach to what we're facing. And that comprehensive approach uh, should also be done in such a way that it's a long term, well, there will be short term 
and long term. So for instance, you can start with good governance very critical. You have to have the culture of transparency, of accountability, of productivity. Dr. Naji alluded to that when he talked about the register, how you come up with the register. And then you, you go to infrastructure. You need to have electricity. All these things we're talking about, you don't have electricity to power your country. What are you saying? What are you doing? Electricity, uh, uh, infrastructure, um, all these things improve living conditions and spur economic activities. And you need those economic activities. And then you go to sustainable um, development. So if you have this um, infrastructure, it would then encourage investment, investment in industries, investment in innovation, and then it will create jobs. And then you go to education. You need the skills for this industry. So you need quality education. Um, you need um, vocational training and education for your people. And then you go to health. You need a healthy population. I was talking to um, someone. I went for a TEDx event, and there was an expert. She was with the Bureau of Statistics. And she said, she gave me a shocking information, 40% of Nigerian children are stunted. Do you know what that means? It means that the cognitive abilities do not develop at all. That is catastrophic. You, you, okay, we have a population, you need that population, right? But if they are stunted and they do not have the capabilities to reach their full potentials as human beings, then it's a problem. So these are issues that the government should look at comprehensively and begin to make the investments. It's not enough to just increase tax. Yes, you, you have to widen the, brax, uh, the, the uh, tax bracket, yeah. but there's much more work to be done other than that. You spoke of uh, vocational training, and it, it reminds us of uh, the continent uh, when it had the apprenticeship, apprenticeship our system. Specifically then, it was big in the east of Nigeria and so many other places. Vocational training and apprenticeship, how can this help in ultimately bringing back life into our economy and of course ultimately bringing back the middle class because we always concentrate on the professionals or the white collar. Yeah, so there are different levels of government in Nigeria, right? There is the responsibility of the federal government, there is also the state government and the local government. It's so complex that sometimes when you're working at the federal level, um, what is happening at the state level is, is, is not what it should be, so the impact is not felt. There should be a sort of synergy. And again, those in government should sit down and really come up with ideas. There are indigenous um, knowledge in many African countries that we have jettisoned for foreign ideas. Foreign ideas, yes, they are, but we should go back to that. Like the vocational thing that we talked about, there's so much indigenous knowledge that we've already jettisoned that you can bring back on board. And then encourage education, you know, quality education, provide quality education, that vocational training because you need it. I mean, there's a lot of work to be mm -hmm. done. The thing is, are you serious? Are you more interested about um, the showmanship that comes with government in these parts of the world? The other day, people were talking about the amount of convoy of the president when he returned from Paris to Lagos. And then some people said, oh, there's, there were so many other special advisors and officials, and that's why the convoy was, was long. For goodness sake, what is important? Are you, are you even in thinking of cutting the cost of governance? These kind of things irks people. It is so insensitive. A lot of people will say that it is so insensitive in this economy that is biting. Really. So what is the seriousness of these people that call themselves government officials? Are they there to do good? Is it about public good or is it about you? These are things you don't need the World Bank to tell you. You need to sit down and work. Well, still on solutions. A point uh, uh, raised there. But uh, I still want to come back to the informal sector and see how much of good it has uh, given to us as a people. Uh, some economists will say, if not for the informal sector, uh, there would have been a drastic collapse in our economy. So it comes back to what we can do to ensure that, uh, for instance, 
uh, the grassroots governance, the local government administration, can see what they can do to help shore up uh, vocational training and that apprenticeship. It's very important because we all grew up seeing how boisterous it was, you know, back in the day in Nigeria. So there is the training, but there is also the opportunities. Do people have the opportunities? You know, so we go back to the issue of what is the infrastructure that is needed most in Nigeria today? Electricity. If that is one thing that this administration is able to do, I think it will shoot up the economy. If that is the only thing, it shouldn't be. But if that is the major thing that you are able to achieve, it will change the face and shape of the country. So when you're training people, they're coming out, there are opportunities for them. And then the people that have the money, the local investors, because we shouldn't focus only on foreign direct investment. The local investors who have the money can put in their money um, into building industries, in the environments, in the you know, local areas, not only in the cities. You also need them in the rural areas. You need those industries. I, I traveled um, to the East recently, and what I saw was mostly just pure buying and selling. There's no economy. It's mostly buying and selling. So if you're not selling something, how do you survive? Um, you need the industries. So it's, it's a wholesome, we need a wholesome rethink of what we want as a society and where we want to go. Are we copying and pasting America? Are we copying and pasting Europe? Is that what we want? Yeah, I, th I think, Dr. Ekoku, you're, you're back to production. That's, uh, that's the whole essence. Because it, it, you notice this because back in the day uh, in Nigeria and even the, the, the Southeast, they were big in you know, production. So, what else can the government do to ensure that this uh, is uh, reignited? Do the work, figure it out. That's why government exists. And you mentioned rightly that most of those industries collapsed. And that is why you saw an exodus of people out of regions to go to the urban centers. Well, apart from that, in the East, it, it was, there was also the impact of the Civil War, which after the whole place was devastated. That's why people say, oh, people are all over the country. Why are you everywhere? It was about economy. People had to go to urban centers where they felt that they would have opportunities. You can bring that back. Not only the federal government, the state government. What are you doing as a state governor? You have to bring back those industries. But of course, uh, we also go to the centralization of the federal government, the laws they make, and uh, the power that they have. Though some of those powers should be devolved to the state level. And then, of course, the economists, you know, they will tell you that apart from that, uh, when you look at the macroeconomics, the high inflation uh, rate, the high interest rate, the, um, the um, catastrophic policies uh, that flip flop all the time, the hostile um, environment, those things do not encourage anybody to invest. You know? So you have to take care of those things comprehensively. Dr. Constance Ikoku, many thanks. Many thanks for having me.